So hi guys, uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Philip Pon from Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and University College London in our QSTM Zoominar. This is a very special QSTM Zoominar because today with this talk, we are completing 100 talks in our series. This is the 100th talk in the series. And he's going to talk about quantum frame co covariance in gauge systems and uh, gravity. And uh, from, I, I know him uh, for last two years from IAS Princeton and uh, he's working on this direction. I know about this and hope we can able to learn something new today in this uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Philip, for agreeing to give this talk and uh, we are welcoming you to give this talk so you can start from your end. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, thanks very much uh, for this invitation to give the centenary talk here. Um, so yeah, sorry about this little delay and uh, the imperfectness of not having full screen, um, but let's go. So yeah, the topic of this talk um, will be how to define the notion of uh, frame covariance for dynamical reference frames, in particular quantum reference frames in different circumstances, in quantum foundations, uh, in gauge theories and in gravity and what that actually entails for the description of physics. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is somewhat loosely based on these references that you see here. Um, in particular, the um, gauge field theory part is still a bit unpublished that should come out in a week or so with my collaborator, Sylvain Carosa. And uh, some of this is also somewhat loosely based on ongoing work with a bunch of uh, people. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, so the topic is going to be uh, reference frames kind of generally, and especially in the beginning, uh, quantum reference frames. Um, so that's a topic that has seen a lot of interest actually in different uh, directions in fundamental physics in recent years. Um, so it appears in gauge theories, gravity, quantum foundations, and quantum information under different topics. Um, and basically the aim of this talk is to try and draw a bit of uh, connections between some of these directions um, and um, yeah, to show uh, sort of a unifying structure um, that underlies the notion of, of dynamic or quantum reference frames. And in particular, um, in quantum foundations, for instance, in recent years, there's been a lot of interest in trying to describe um, physics from the perspective of some quantum particle. So in some sense to jump loosely speaking into a quantum particles reference frame. So that will appear here, especially the first part of the talk, quantum information. Um, I will not talk about that actually so much today, um, but one of the core questions where reference frames appear is in, in quantum communication. And the problem is a very operational practical one. How can different parties actually communicate quantum information where they don't share a reference frame. And then as you might know in, 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 in gravity, of course, there's uh, well, reference frames are key. Um, and in particular also in order to define uh, diffeomorphism invariant observables, such as relational address observables, reference frames play a key role. And in gauge theories in recent years, there's also been quite some um, uh, focus on, on a certain notion of reference frames that sort of tell you how um, adjacent subregions, so for instance, finite subregions, how they might couple to one another. And this will actually lead to the notion of edge modes. And um, yeah, so here in this talk, um, I will try to um, elucidate a bit uh, some of the underlying structure. And in particular, in the beginning, I will um, talk mostly, in fact, about finite dimensional systems and quantum foundations or quantum cosmology. And then in the second part of the talk, I will also go into gauge theories. Now, um, in order to understand uh, some of the motivation um, uh, for this line of research, let me go back to something that most of you will probably be familiar with, and that's the notion of general covariance, um, which loosely speaking states that all the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. So it tells us already something that, you know, there's something that's frame independent, and we usually uh, take that to entail that um, physical laws are given as tensor equations, and we can in fact view um, these tensors really as some, in some sense as reference frame neutral objects, and they encode um, really 
the, um, the physics as seen by, by any reference frame in space time. So for instance, you can think of the um, stress energy tensor or the um, energy momentum tensor. Um, it encodes the energy momentum flux that any reference frame, physical reference frame will see. You just have to, for instance, specify some forward velocity vector with which we contract the, um, the tensor and that'll spit out numbers that will correspond to something in principle measurable in, in the corresponding frame. Now, um, this frame neutrality will be kind of important uh, later on, um, at least conceptually. Um, now, in order to also encode this general covariance, and, and uh, um, which also somehow entails, of course, that we have descriptions um, of the same physics relative to different frames, what do we mean by that in, in general relativity usually? Um, well, we mean the following. So first of all, we sort of idealize reference frames. So even though we might think of Alice and Bob traveling through space time in some uh, space uh, rocket ships, um, we uh, idealize the reference frame by some, maybe some vector frame that is uh, kind of external to, to space time in the sense that it's kind of painted onto space time. We just look at uh, how the um, how the, the corresponding vector frame might evolve through uh, space time, but we usually ignore, of course, any internal uh, dynamics or any coupling or back reaction of these frames onto other physics. And when we do that, um, in order to, we can consider such a description um, before we actually pick a reference frame as, um, you know, uh, as being some frame neutral description that's sort of encoded in, in, in tensor fields. But if we want to go into some uh, internal frame uh, description or you know, describe the physics as seen as from Alice's or Bob's frame, we, we specify that, for instance, a corresponding vector frame and that defines a coordinate system um, relative to Alice's frame or relative to Bob's frame, for example. And um, uh, yeah, those, those coordinate descriptions we can view as their perspectives on the local physics in space time. And of course, if you want to go from um, one perspective to another, say from Alice's to Bob's, and as you obviously know, we just uh, do these uh, um, compositions of the coordinate maps. Um, it has a nice compositional structure. So we um, basically invert the co coordinate map relative to Alice that maps us back to the frame neutral physics in space time. And then uh, we concatenate with a forward map of, um, uh -huh. of Bob's perspective. And then we get into Bob's frame perspective. And so the important thing here so you all know all these things, of course, but the important thing here is, um, and for later, is um, that the map from one frame perspective to another is always via sort of the frame neutral physics. And um, the question that we want to raise now is what actually happens when we go away from such idealizations and ultimately we take serious that um, uh, reference frames are always attached to physical systems and that they are ultimately also subject uh, to the laws of quantum theory itself. And so, Ultimately, the, the main question is um, then how do we make sense of something like general covariance when frames are also quantum? And can we get something like a similar compositional structure between internal frame perspectives, or internal quantum frame perspectives uh, also uh, in the quantum theory? So that's um, sort of the warm up for, the, um, for this talk. Um, and here is uh, the menu for the rest of the talk. So, in the first part of this talk, um, I will talk mainly about quantum frame covariance in, in finite dimensional systems, so sort of mechanical or quantum cosmological um, systems. First, I will discuss a bit conceptually what I mean by a quantum reference frame. Then I will explain um, what we call a perspective neutral approach to quantum frame covariance. So that's sort of a quantum implementation of uh, this compositional structure of frame changes that I've just uh, shown you um, classically. So that will give you a sort of, in some sense, a quantum implementation of uh, similar structures. And then we will discuss some um, uh, uh, physical consequences of this. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we will have time to discuss all of these things, um, I'll de decide along the way whether I leave some of these things out or not. And in the second part of the talk, um, I will then go more into gauge theories. Um, the topic there will be mostly edge modes and uh, how we can understand them as internalized or as so-called internalized external reference frames. I will illustrate that first in mechanics, and then I will go to gauge theories. Um, and if we have time in the end, I might uh, discuss a bit um, how dynamic reference frames are actually important for the interpretation of gauge-invariant observables. Okay. Um, 
Right, so let's uh, get started. Um, so yeah, the basic setup that we're gonna be discussing here in this talk is um, that we have, that we're given some system S um, that's subject to some symmetry group G. And what we will be assuming is that um, states, so they could be classical or quantum, doesn't really matter at this point. So um, I'm just gonna be quite general here. Um, that states that are related um, by uh, such a um, symmetry group element that they're going to be indistinguishable for all of these group elements when the system S is considered in isolation. So, and this can be implemented in many different contexts. Um, so for example, um, and in the beginning, I will consider something as follows, like suppose we're given some group of particles and um, that could be the system. And then uh, the symmetry could be, for instance, some spatial symmetry like rotations or translations if you want. Um, but later we might also see um, another example could be something like quantum clocks or, or, or dynamical clock systems and the, where the symmetry is something like reparameterization invariance or temporal diffeomorphism symmetry. Another example could be that the system is uh, some gauge field in some finite region, for example, and the group is uh, the set of um, group valued functions in that uh, space time region. Um, so a gauge group. And, um, and another example is that uh, we consider um, dynamic fields in space time as the system and uh, the group is then the diffeomorphisms. And the basic premise um, tells us that um, if we now imply um, uh, some symmetry uh, or some group element to, for example, here, particle configuration, um, the premise tells us that internally this will be indistinguishable. So what I mean is, you know, when S is considered in isolation, that means without any external reference frame or any external relatum. So, and then in order to make sense of this, what we would like to do is come up with an internal description of such a system. Um, and so basically we describe S from the inside. And the idea is that we pick some subsystem of S um, here, for instance, some particle within it as some subsystem R relative to which we describe the system. And, um, okay. Okay. So, and, the, um, and now the question is, what is uh, such a refer dynamical reference frame uh, in general? What do we mean by this? So when we're given some gauge group uh, G or some symmetry group G, um, we'll generally call a G frame some system R, like this picture of this particle that's described by some set of degrees of freedom that has to have at least the dimension of the group, at least locally. Um, and that transforms faithfully under this group. So in the sense that there aren't any group um, elements acting on the configurations of that frame that, uh, that will leave all these configura configurations invariant. And in particular, we'd be interested in something like complete frames and complete frames are uh, systems R, which are such that the group acts on them um, transitively and freely, which means that the isotropy group is trivial for any configuration. So it means any, um, you know, that all uh, group elements except the identity act non-trivially on, on any of the configurations of this uh, reference system. And in that sense, um, this configuration space, call it X, uh, will be something like a homogeneous space for this group. And that means we can basically use the configurations to coordinateize the orbits of this group in, in state space, for example, or also in, in, in observable space later on. And what we shall be doing is we shall um, call these uh, configurations of R the orientations of the frame. And um, yeah, and, and the main purpose is that we will um, uh, use it, like I said, so to, to use these orientations to parameterize or gauge fix um, the group orbits in, in, in state space or observable space. Um, and we will use it basically to describe how other degrees of freedom are going to um, uh, relate uh, to the reference frame degrees of freedom as, um, as the joint system might transform under the, under the group. And um, here in you know, the examples of these reference systems, they can be many things. So here, what we're discussing here on the screen is for instance, it could be like one of the particles and uh, the degrees of freedom could be position or orientation. Um, for reparameterization invariant, it will be some, um, some relation of clock function um, uh, in, 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 in gauge field theory. Um, it will be, for example, edge mode as we might see later. And uh, well, in, in space time, when we're looking at uh, the homomorphism group, it will be some reference fields that may in fact also be edge modes. Okay, now one thing that we will run into is that, and that's already what I 
kind of sort of motivated in the beginning is um, that uh, there will be in general, um, of course, a multiple choice problem of which frame we will be able to choose. There will exist in general many different choices and the question is how do we relate them? Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, yes. my question is like the, uh, so I can understand the setup now, uh, you are going to promote this setup to describe some quantum systems, obviously. Now, question yeah. is, this quantum system is adiabatic or closed system, or this might be anything like an open system which is interacting with some thermal bath or environment or something like that. So, because uh, yeah, so that's a very yeah, so that's a very good question. So, um, so first of all, it doesn't have to be a quantum system at this point. So. In the first half of the talk, I will be mostly talking about quantum systems, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so it also apply, you can also do it classically. But um, yeah, in, in general, what's the system uh, that this applies to? It depends very much on the setup. It can be many different things. So it's just generally speaking, it's whatever um, the you know system that the group really acts on. So it could be a closed system. It might also be an open system. For instance, maybe it's some open system in the um, in the laboratory um, that some external observer might be able to uh, manipulate from the outside, but which by itself is otherwise um, subject to some symmetry principle um, when you don't have access to an external I, frame. I have asked this question that uh, we know that like when we talk about the subsistence for open system, it is usually non-unitary. But when you talk about the closed system, it is not, it is unitary. So does this unitary issue yeah. will give some kind of new insight or it is not at all, in the, it's immaterial? Um, yeah, so, I mean, when you talk about unitary versus non-unitary, you refer to the dynamics. So here, the, um, as long as we're not talking about temporal diffeomorphism symmetry, then, you know, the symmetries will be, um, yeah, there won't be dynamical symmetries. And in that case, you can look at these reference, trans reference frame transformations at any fixed point of time. So you can consider them as being part of the kinematical structure, in which sense the dynamics interaction or not will not play such a big role, actually. Okay. Um, it's, it's a bit, uh, you know, when, when we're going to gravity, um, then things are, of course, slightly different because then uh, yeah. the symmetries are intertwined with, um, with the dynamics. But as long as we're not there, you can actually consider the, the reference frame transformations independently of, of the interactions. Okay. Thank you for this. You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So One, anyway, so uh, here, uh, Philip, could I ask a question? Like you talked about like particle position and relational time. Like, do you like do you consider Lorentz symmetry in this case uh, or? Uh, um, yeah. So one could be considering Lorentz symmetry as well. So here in these examples um, that we've studied so far, we haven't actually done that, but in principle, you could do it. I mean, you just need to have a, um, yeah, I mean, a good representation of Lorentz symmetry. So if you wanted to do it with, um, so, so I mean, one of the reasons why it's a little tricky to go into this is um, with, uh, um, in, in the quantum theory at least, is that, um, uh, you know, if you want to consider internal reference frames, we usually need multi-particle systems. And um, uh, usually, you know, if you want to deal with that in a quantum theory in a unitary way, then you need to go straight to a quantum field theory. So, and that's uh, technically somewhat challenging. So it's something that we are actually currently studying as well. It's not completely finished. Um, so that's why, let me just say for the moment, um, uh, in principle, yes, uh, in the quantum theory, you can do it. It's just a little trickier, but, um, but uh, yeah, in principle, you can do it. And, and classically, um, you could do it with Lorentz symmetry as well. In fact, uh, one of the following slides will give a slight analogy with that. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, basically, yes. Yeah, so, so the thing is, I mean, one of the main ideas is um, so that you know we have these different. Um, sorry, the the different so so the states um, related by by group transformations. Um, as I said before, internally they're indistinguishable, so they're going to be part of one of the same relational equivalent or yeah, equivalence class of states, um, namely internally indistinguishable states. Um, but what I want to argue um, later is that they can be considered as different descriptions of the same relational states. 
in particular, different descriptions, we will relate them to different um, uh, reference frame perspectives. And um, these equivalence classes are what we're going to call in the end these perspective neutral states, or they're kind of some analog of, of uh, some sense what tensors are in, in, in space time. They encode uh, the information of any internal um, frame perspective. Um, these equivalence classes here um, for dynamic reference frames, um, they will do the same thing both classically and the quantum theory. Okay, so um, somehow whenever, sorry, there's somehow always a problem when I want to move to the next slides. Um, uh, uh, it's, it doesn't work with, uh, I have to click several times, but anyway, okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, here's a slight analogy with uh, special relativity how we can think about it. So you can, of course, um, consider something like the, um, the space time in a product between two four vectors. It doesn't really matter what they mean. Um, that's, of course, a um, Lorentz frame independent uh, number that you get there. It's, it's frame neutral uh, physics in that sense. Um, so it's the same physical situation, but you can, in general, of course, describe it many, many different ways. So um, if you choose a particular Lorentz frame, then um, well, you, know, you will describe your vector components of U and V in a particular way. And if you now pick some uh, Lorentz transformed uh, reference frame, then you get some U prime, V prime with different components. And, but the total number is the same. So the total number is something that's sort of a reference frame neutral. Um, but uh, the way it is composed um, of the internal uh, in, in, of the frame components is different in different uh, frame perspectives. And in this sense, um, you get different descriptions of one and the same physical situation, um, and in particular, different um, or yeah, um, non invariant descriptions of one and the same invariant information. And so you can think of this uh, uh, in some analogy um, to what's going to happen here. And uh, of course, you know, as you know, um, uh, despite the fact that you know there's some invariance, um, these uh, uh, the way the, the frame components differ from frame to frame um, leads then to the relativity of many physical properties. And the question here will, of course, also in particular in the quantum theory, will be, um, you know, is there also something like a quantum relativity or quantum frame relativity of physical properties? And indeed, that's what we're going to find. Okay, so. Um, let me just um, briefly uh, discuss the main ideas underlying uh, what we call the perspective neutral approach um, to frame covariance uh, in a nutshell. So um, here, uh, one of the key ingredients is actually, in fact, redundancy. Um, and that comes from the symmetry of the game. So remember, we have this premise that there's the system and the symmetry is acting on it. And um, the symmetry induces some redundancy in the description. And so it means that it exists, you know, as I already indicated, many different ways in describing the same physical situation. We have this equivalence class, many members in an equivalence class that describe the same physical situation. And what we want to do is associate these different uh, descriptions with uh, different internal frame choices. And so in some sense, we choose uh, the redundancy that rises. Um, we choose the redundant degrees of freedom to coincide with reference degrees of freedom. Um, so as not to, um, in the end, describe the reference frame relative to itself and avoid a self-reference. And uh, in the quantum theory, um, the way we will handle this is, in fact, by group averaging, by coherent group averaging. So if you have some uh, quantum state rho, uh, could be a pure or um, mixed state, doesn't really matter. Um, and what we will be doing is we're going to um, group average over whatever this, this gauge group G is. Um, so this year's quantum mechanics, we're, uh, quantum field theory will be a little trickier. Um, so we're basically going to the zero charge sector of that group, in the unitary representation. And for pure states, for example, what we're going to be looking at is um, that uh, well, this, this group averaging projector for continuous groups will, in fact, be not a proper projector, but it doesn't really matter for the moment. Um, but it will project um, what we call kinematical states into uh, what we call physical states, so into invariant states, so states that are, uh, that are invariant under the unitary transformations associated with the group elements. And so um, these uh, states are what we will be calling perspective neutral states. Um, the, they are the coherently group average states. And let me say a little more about this. So what's the idea here? Um, so again, uh, this goes under you know, redundancy. 
So if we have um, a situation like this here where um, some group representation is leaving physical states invariant, and suppose we can write uh, this unitary as some combination of uh, generators, um, uh, then um, uh, you know, this is equivalent to saying that these generators will leave will annihilate those states, um, so they're actually constrained. So maybe you're familiar with constraint Dirac quantization. So, and of course these constraints, they induce um, algebraic relations between the um, degrees of freedom. Um, so that's uh, one source of redundancy in the description. Um, so, and, and that leads in leads to many different ways in describing the same invariant states psi phys. Um, as I said, we want to associate these um, different ways with uh, internal, frame perspectives. And um, the idea is that we uh, define reduction maps. So something like re symmetry reduction maps, um, they're related to gauge fixing um, that remove redundancy um, relative to particular frame choice. And um, we will take them in the end as quantum coordinate maps that uh, take us from this perspective neutral structure of these physical states, that, of these invariant states into a given uh, internal frame perspective. So I will illustrate that in an example, if that's a little abstract here. And so then, yeah, basically the main idea is that these physical states are perspective neutral states. So they encode all the internal frame perspectives and consider them as a description of the physics prior to having chosen such an internal frame relative to which we describe the dynamics of the remaining degrees of freedom. In that sense, you can view these psi phys, these states, these perspective neutral states indeed as an equivalence class uh, of, of, um, of, of states. Uh, and that, of course, also has to do with the fact that um, you know there are projections of kinematical states. So, and, and projected states are, of course, uh, you can always view them as as um, equivalence classes of states. So, um, now let me, if this is a little abstract, let me illustrate this really in the simplest possible setup, um, which is um, a translation symmetry in one dimension. So, suppose we're given three particles subject to global translation invariance in one dimensional space. Um, so the premise is now that uh, we require the physics to be invariant under these global translations. Um, so that uh, tells us, first of all, the following. So we can start in the quantum theory um, with a kinematic Hilbert space, uh, which is just a tensor product of L2 Rs, one each for uh, these three particles A, B, C. And now uh, the constraint that arises um, uh, for translation symmetry is just the global uh, momentum, the total momentum. Um, if we set unit masses also in particular, I oh, know, sorry, there's an independent of the mass. Um, so the total momentum has to vanish. So then physical states or perspective neutral states are now quantum states that are annihilated um, by the total momentum. Now, the individual positions of A, B, and C, so Q, A, Q, B, Q, C, are um, not gauge invariant. They're not translation invariant. So, um, they're, so the position relative to the background reference frame, if you want, is not physical or is not, um, yeah, is, 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 um, yeah, is not invariant. Um, now, the, we, we can um, write now physical states, so solving this constraint um, in the following way. So we can just go into a momentum representation of of kinematical states on this Hilbert space. And then basically you just throw in, um, you know, pick an arbitrary kinematical state, you just throw in such a delta function here. And this gives you a redundancy in the description because you can now solve that delta function in many different ways. For instance, you can solve it for PA, for PB, PC, or some combination. And um, you also have a redundancy in the invariant observables. So translation invariant observables are of course relative distances. And it's clear that, uh, for instance, QB minus QC is just um, the difference between the first two. So in that sense, there's an algebraic relation between these uh, invariant observables. And also the three momenta are not, in, uh, are not all independent because they have to satisfy the constraint. So in that sense, even though we're dealing with gauge invariant information, um, uh, it's not, there's a redundancy in the description. And which degrees of freedom we pick as the redundant ones, that's, uh, that's of course for us to, to choose. Now, um, here we could say, let's, let's go into A's perspective. So we jump in some sense into the reference frame of A and want to describe B and C relative to A. And the way you can do it is um, you can define this reduction map. So it's in some sense like a quantum gauge fixing if you want. Um, we just condition um, the physical state, the perspective neutral state 
let's say, on, on setting A to be the origin. So we, we, we set Q A to be zero, um, why not? It turns out that you can actually, this conditioning, um, it's a map that in fact can be uh, inverted, but only on the physical Hilbert space. Um, so when I go back here, you will not be able to invert this on the total uh, Hilbert space because of course the conditioning will in general remove uh, uh, non-trivial information, but physical states um, um, that, that define uh, a physical Hilbert space, uh, that's not uh, the kinematic Hilbert space, but uh, well, this will be an L2 over R2. Uh, in fact, because of the redundancy, when we condition on it, um, this conditioning will just remove redundant information which is the reason why you can actually, um, in that case, invert uh, uh, for physical states uh, this map. And so you can view this in, in, in really as a quantum coordinate map into A's perspective. It removes all degrees of freedom of A, and it's, it's locally invertible. So then um, when we um, condition the physical states on it, um, we consider this as the description of B and C relative to A. So there's no more A degrees of freedom in the, in the, um, in the in, in the state description, um, there's only B and C uh, descriptions in it. And now we can also transform these observables under these quantum coordinate maps, so these gauge invariant observables, and they just remove any A dependence. Um, uh, so they basically really give us like the, the relative distances now, we just become the distances QJ. So it's really like seeing the distance of particle J, so if J is either B or C relative to A, and where the momenta are left invariant. So we can view this as the description of, of B and C relative to A. And now um, we could have done the same thing relative to particle B, for example. So here we have reduced with respect to A, but we could also do it with respect to B or C. And now the main idea is that this Hilbert space of physical states, that's this perspective neutral um, Hilbert space that I said, so, sort of the link between all these internal perspectives. So, so far we went into A's perspective. So it gives us this quantum coordinate map RA if you want. And but we could have done the same with respect to B, called RB. That gives us then B's perspective on A and C. And now, um, since these are invertible for physical states, um, uh, we can actually go from, from A's perspective to B's perspective by inverting this quantum coordinate map, mapping it back to the perspective neutral Hilbert space, and then um, going forward with the new quantum coordinate map to, um, to B's perspective. And so in that sense here, this really has the same compositional structure as uh, coordinate changes on a manifold, just that here we are mapping between different uh, Hilbert spaces. And now, um, so here, this uh, in this simple example, the, um, this map actually can be simplified. It uh, takes this particular form. This is a so-called parity swap operator. It reproduces a quantum reference frame transformation that has been uh, proposed in a different way before. Um, without any uh, um, such symmetries here or any perspective neutral structure, any constraints. And so it tells us that we can actually cover something that has been already uh, um, proposed elsewhere in the quantum foundations community before. And um, as was already shown in that reference, um, uh, these quantum coordinate changes, or these, sorry, these quantum reference frame transformations, they actually induce um, something like a dependence of correlations and superpositions on uh, on the frame choice. So, for example, just if you look at this uh, this picture down here, um, in C perspectives, you might have A and B um, that are entangled um, with one another. Um, and when you take the same state and you map it to A perspective, what you will find, so using this uh, frame transformation that I showed you before, what you will find is that in fact uh, C, so the old frame, will become delocalized. Um, and, and B will become localized. So in that sense, whether there's a superposition or not, or correlations, um, that depends uh, on, on the um, choice of frame. So I will say a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, that's just to give you a bit of a taste of what happens. Um, so here I've given you really the simplest possible implementation in terms of really just translations in one dimensions. So it turns out you can actually generalize this to um, any general unimodular groups. You can also go beyond unimodular groups. It's a little trickier, so I will not talk about that here. Um, so uh, just to give you um, sort of a short idea of how to do it, I'm not gonna go into the details. So the basic idea is that we assume that this kinematical Hilbert space, so the, the Hilbert space corresponding to all degrees of freedom uh, takes a tensor product uh, structure between 
this G frame R, um, which in the previous example was just you know the particle position, but here for a general group it can be something way more complex. And then we have some uh, system Hilbert space, and we assume that this carries some unitary representation of of G, where G is some unimodular group, and uh, so a product representation of that form. And um, the now the question is so so if, if we go back here, um, you know these these quantum coordinate maps they were given by conditioning um, on here on the frame position. So we can call that basically, you know, these are the configurations of the frame. So coming back to what I said somewhat earlier in the, in the talk, um, um, these are the, the frame configurations. So they're like the frame orientations in fact. Um, uh, so now the question is, what are frame orientation states when you have a general group? And what you can do is you can just use coherent states in fact, um, and then the, the coherent states, uh, they label the frame uh, orientations. Um, um, yeah, so these, 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 uh, these, these frame uh, orientations of, um, so these are states for R, I should say, in, in the Hilbert space of HR, or they may be in fact distributions on it, it doesn't really matter at this point, and they transform sort of covariantly under um, being, you know, uh, uh, coherent states, they transform covariantly in, in the sense for instance, by left action. So in general, these, these states are not necessarily orthogonal, but it doesn't really matter. Um, these relational or relative observables, um, these gauge invariant observables that are important in these, uh, these uh, internal frame physics, um, they can be generalized to arbitrary groups. So before, um, in this example, um, they were these relative distances between uh, the particles. So for a general group, um, well, it would be a little more complicated, but it turns out you can always construct these objects. Uh, via these frame orientation states. Um, and uh, well, basically this here is, is an object, it's, it turns out to be gauge invariant, so it commutes with all the group elements. And um, what this embodies in a gauge invariant way is the value of, of the system function Fs um, when the reference frame is in orientation G. So before, um, what we were looking at is, uh, you know, the position, for instance, of particle B when when particle A is in the origin. So this here is a, a generalization to um, you know, more general groups. Um, so, I mean, you can understand that from the fact that here, this is sort of like a conditioning on, on the frame uh, orientation. Well, that's just a, a system observable. And then when you average over the group, um, you make that whole thing gauge invariant. Okay, so that's just to give you an idea. If you don't understand the details, it's, it's okay. Um, it's just to give you the idea that uh, this can be done for fairly general groups and is not specific to this translation group, for example. And here again, um, if you wanna consider a quantum reference frame changes, we have to um, consider now uh, actually two reference frames um, and the system uh, under the same setup basically. And here we will just again use the um, the coherent states as frame orientation states, as conditioning physical states on the frame orientation states. And you know, the, the way um, these frame um, changes work is again in the same way. So we have the perspective neutral physical Hilbert space of states that are invariant under group transformations um, of this group G that we're considering. And then, uh, well, these, these conditioning maps, they're like the quantum coordinate maps, they can be inverted for physical states and that um, when you want to go from um, the descriptions relative to one choice of frame to that of another, um, then you have that nice compositional form uh, like coordinate changes on a manifold. And by now we have written many papers about this for many concrete examples um, for sp specific groups. So here uh, we will write a paper soon on, 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 on this for general groups. So that's just to, um, uh, to emphasize that this can be done for, for fairly general groups. Now, um, yeah, basically, I think I've, I've just said that. Maybe we'll skip that slide. Um, um, yeah, so here I wanted to give um, an example of uh, for quantum clocks or quantum time, but I think let me skip this topic because there's a couple of other things I wanted to say, and time is progressing pretty quickly. Let me maybe just uh, say one thing. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, relational dynamics and uh, that there exist um, uh, well, different formulations of relational dynamics. Um, so in the literature, for instance, um, uh, Carlo Rovelli had proposed this idea of relational observables to encode um, dynamics in, in generally covariant systems. 
And in the 80s, there's been also this approach um, by Page and Wooters, unconditional state formulations, uh, deriving a Schrodinger equation for, um, for uh, Hamiltonian constraint systems. And there also exists another method by quantum symmetry reduction. Um, and in fact, using these methods that I described sort of, uh, or that I summarized in the previous slides, what we showed was in fact that um, all these different formulations are in fact exactly equivalent. You can map them uh, into one another. So they give you in some sense, three different formulations of the relational dynamics um, or three, yeah, the three different phases of one and the same relational dynamics, let's say. And which is why we call this the trinity of relational quantum dynamics. So this um, uh, resolved, in fact, uh, um, yeah, a long-standing open question in, in, in the community. But uh, I think I will not uh, go much into this because I think I will focus more on uh, uh, on reference frames and also in particular in field theory later. So let me go now more to. Um, uh, uh, physical consequences of these reference frame transformations. Um, so I already indicated in this one example that um, that uh, correlations and superpositions, for instance, will depend on the choice of frame. Um, and there's a way to make all of this much more robust and much more transparent. And this is what we've done in a paper earlier this year. Um, so uh, to be concrete, it's uh, so there we considered um, a constraint um, that's of this form. So again, we consider like three subsystems ABC. They don't have to be particles. They can also be quarks, for instance. It doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, the total constraint is either um, a U1 or a translation group generator uh, for simplicity. But the arguments, in fact, they generalize also. But uh, it's uh, kind of technically challenging to prove some of these things. Um, so uh, here we keep for now um, to the simpler setup. So in particular, there's no coupling terms between A, B, and C. Um, turns out that if you include coupling terms, uh, it makes things really uh, very, very complicated um, and analytically almost not tractable. So, um, but if, if you want to know more about it, you can ask me after the talk. Now, anyway, um, so uh, basically what we've shown is that uh, um, the choice of frame that you, that you make, so for instance here, whether you pick A, B, or C as a reference frame, uh, that this will induce different tensor factorizations of your Hilbert space, which explains then the frame dependence, for instance, of correlations. So, um, and in particular, uh, what we can do is, um, uh, yeah, to write down um, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for the algebra of physical observables. So A phys here is um, the equivalent of what I called H phys before, just for observables. So H phys was, the, um, the set of gauge invariant states. Now, AFIS is the set of gauge invariant observables uh, with support on, on HFIS. So basically, any AFIS is, um, is, is the, the set of linear operators on HFIS. Um, so now we can ask the question um, when uh, uh, can we find the system in such a way that the observable algebras um, uh, actually factorize in a particular way? And here, the important thing is that um, a priori, you know, A, B, and C are kinematical subsystems. So there are subsystems on the kinematic Hilbert space and on the kinematical algebra. But uh, when we solve the constraints, uh, the physical Hilbert space is in general not a subspace of the kinematical Hilbert space. And it might come with its own tensor product structure or not. And so um, the gauge invariant tensor product structure will in general be, uh, in fact, is not related or is. Is, is um, yeah, the, or let me put it this way. The, the physical Hilbert space does in general not uh, inherit the, um, the, the tensor product structure of the kinematical Hilbert space, at least not in full. Um, and because you know, a tensor product structure uh, has to be sort of probable in terms of, uh, of commuting subsets of, of observables. And uh, well, on, on the physical Hilbert space, you have to deal with um, commuting subsets of gauge invariant observables. Whereas for the kinematic Hilbert space, that's not the case. Um, then you can pick any commuting subsets of observables. Now, um, it turns out, so we've shown that um, a necessary and sufficient condition for this uh, physical uh, observable algebra to factorize across um, A and B, so relative to C. So um, these, these uh, this, this algebra A relative to C, you can think of the relational observables of A relative to C. So I gave you before 
um, briefly um, this description of relational observables. Um, they always involve a choice of frame. So you describe some, some other degrees of freedom relative to a choice of frame. And then this algebra of B, C, B relative to C is then, well, any degrees of freedom of B described relative to C, relational observables of B relative to C. And it turns out this, um, this A phys algebra is isomorphic to such a factorization if and only if a certain um, uh, condition on the spectrum of this constraint is satisfied. What this condition is exactly doesn't really matter for the following. I've written it down here, but let's not go into these details. It doesn't really matter. It's just important that one can write down necessary and sufficient conditions and they are restrictive and in general, they're not satisfied. Um, so then uh, another thing that we uh, could write down is um, or that we found is that the, um, that the factorizability will in general be frame dependent. So even if um, this condition here is satisfied relative to one choice of frame, uh, for instance, relative to choice uh, C, so picking C as a reference frame, it can happen that if you now want to pick B as your reference frame, this will lead to a different condition on the spectrum um, that may not be in fact uh, satisfied in general. And we also give practical examples of it. So you can find examples where the, um, where the total algebra of invariant observables factorizes uh, um, relative to the relational observables relative to C um, of A and B relative to C, but it won't factorize uh, relative to reference frame B. And uh, even more so, um, uh, even if, if uh, um, this condition here that, uh, uh, that there's a factorization is in fact satisfied both relative to uh, C and B, so it, it, there are examples when that's the case. In general, it will turn out um, that these tensor factorizations are in fact inequivalent in the sense that, for instance, the relational observable algebra of uh, describing A relative to B, so that's this factor here, is in general different from the relational observable algebra describing properties of A relative to C, which is this factor. So it means um, even if, we, uh, if the total algebra factorizes um, relative to two different frame perspectives, um, this factorization will be uh, inequivalent. It will be different in the different frame perspectives. And this, of course, induces also um, a gauge invariant tensor factorization of the physical Hilbert space or of the perspective neutral Hilbert space. And um, now when we go into the different frame perspectives, um, uh, effectively what's happening is that we're, um, uh, that we're describing one of the same physics uh, with different tensor factorizations. We take one of the same uh, physical states, but we describe it in different um, gauge invariant tensor factorizations. And that's the reason why um, ultimately, uh, for instance, correlations and superpositions and so on become frame dependent. So, um, so this here is basically um, what I just said before. So that the even if, yeah, so that the algebra, uh, the, the factorizations will differ, and really what that means is that um, what, uh, for instance, frames B and C mean when they refer to the subsystem A, these are literally different degrees of freedom. So these are different um, uh, gauge invariant degrees of freedom, different, and that just means there's different relational ways of referring to one of the same sub kinematical subsystem A. So, and that's, uh, yeah, the upshot of this is that we have a um, frame dependence of gauge invariant entanglement. So this gives you a, a transparent explanation of these observations in this paper earlier. And in particular, what also follows from this is for instance, that um, the entanglement entropy for subsystems such as subsystem A um, relative to B and C will in general be um, distinct for one of the same global physical states. That is to say for one of the same perspective neutral states. So in that sense, we also get a, a frame dependence of, of the entanglement entropy. Um, and so basically the, the notion of subsystem um, becomes frame dependent. Okay, and this has a lot of different consequences. Um, so as I said, entanglement superpositions become a frame dependent. So there's a quantum relativity of, of these properties. Um, also, for instance, comparing and reading, uh, the comparing the readings uh, of different clocks and synchronizing different quantum clocks becomes frame dependent. Temporal locality uh, becomes frame dependent, and there's many different, uh, many other uh, funny effects that you can derive using these frame transformations, which are discussed in, in these references. And I won't discuss that here uh, due to shortness of time. Um, yeah, here, okay, that would be an example of uh, how um, time evolution or relational time evolution becomes um, 
um, can be local relative to one quantum clock, but uh, non-local or superposition relative to another, superposition of different time evolutions relative to another clock. But uh, since I didn't discuss the quantum clocks before, let me maybe not discuss this here in, in more depth. And instead, uh, maybe let's go into um, the topic of edge modes, unless there's some, some question maybe at this point. I don't know if, uh, if you have any questions so far. If that's not the case, maybe I'll just move on. So, <clears throat> so basically, this, this is now the second part of the talk. Um, and perhaps you have heard of the notion of edge modes in, in gauge field theories and gravity. And so what I want to try and argue now in, in, in most of the remnant of the talk is that you can really think of edge modes um, uh, as reference frames in the same sense in which I've discussed dynamical reference frames up to this point. And in particular, you can view them as uh, internalized external frames relative to a system. So internalized the sense that um, if you're looking at some subregion in space time, then uh, basically edge modes correspond to dynamical reference frames that are external to that subregion, but that you internalize on the, for instance, on the, in the, into the phase space um, to describe uh, degrees of freedom of your subregion relative to, uh, to that external frame. So that's what we want to see. Um, now, let me start again conceptually um, before I illustrate this. So, um, so far, um, we're not discussing anything like external reference frames. We just discussed internal reference frames. But now, um, coming back to these pictures from the beginning, we could also have, for instance, now, you know, Alice, uh, who's looking at this group of particles um, in, in her external frame. You now, before, um, we had the situation that uh, we could, uh, you know, apply some symmetry transformation to the system of interest. And the premise was that um, this was indistinguishable relative to the internal frame. But of course, if we have the situation as here, the point is that this is distinguishable relative to the external frame. And we have to distinguish that situation from the uh, case where uh, we take um, uh, this situation here, where we rotate both the, the system and the external frame. From the point of view of the subsystem, the group of particles of interest, we can't distinguish the situation because um, well, you know, the relations in the particle group are going to be invariant. Um, but of course, uh, relative to the external frame, uh, there would be a difference in one case and not in the other. Um, so this latter transformation here doesn't change the relation between the, um, Alice, for instance, and the group of particles. But uh, in the first situation, the relation between them changes. Now, and of course, there can be other external reference frames um, uh, and so in some sense, you can view this, what's going to happen here, as you can have more and more external observers that are describing, um, you know, dynamical uh, systems, internal dynamical systems. And in some sense, uh, this is somewhat analogous to the extension of the Heisenberg cut, except that uh, here, I'm not really going to discuss measurement interactions. And so, yeah, what, what's irrelevant for purely internal descriptions, and that's what we did in the first part of the talk, um, you know, it might be relevant for uh, the relations of the system relative to its environment or to external frames. Um, <clears throat> let me maybe skip that here and, and just uh, jump straight into an illustration again in, in, this, in these particle models. So um, one thing is that if you're familiar with edge modes, uh, you might uh, know of this distinction between gauge transformations and symmetries uh, that has been discussed there. So um, here we can actually identify them in terms of the reference frame structures. Um, that's a new perspective on them. So um, suppose we're given, again, some system S such as particle ABC in the uh, 1D translation invariance. Um, so the eternal physics is invariant under such a translation. So again, as before, we have these uh, relational data relative um, positions are invariant. And uh, the translation generator is this constraint here. Um, but now suppose we add an additional degree of freedom, let's call it R. And so um, this is now a degree of freedom that's external to the system S, but it's a dynamic degree of freedom. Um, we are now going to describe it dynamically. So it's like the internalization of an external reference frame to the system S. And suggestively, we can already call that an edge mode. So we will see later in gauge theories um, that this is uh, analogous. So um, and now um, we can use this external reference frame R uh, to in fact turn all degrees of freedom of ABC into gauge invariant ones. Um, 
And because we can now describe, for instance, the positions of ABC relative to R. So we just look at, for instance, the relative uh, um, the positions of ABC relative to R, the momenta R already um, translation invariant. And more generally, we can actually uh, write this um, in terms of the so-called relation observables. Um, this is a power series um, uh, representation of such relation observables um, that has been developed by Bianca Dittrich uh, well, 15 years ago. And um, you see appearing in it here this uh, frame orientation label X. So here in this uh, situation, the frame orientation is just the position of the particle R. And you can interpret um, this gauge invariant object. Um, so X, I should say, is just, uh, it's a parameter. It's not a um, dynamic degree of freedom. And you can um, interpret this degree of freedom here, which clearly is translation invariant as what's the position of a particle I when, um, when uh, um, the reference particle is in position X. Um, so this will become relevant in a minute. So this is uh, related to what I discussed before for general groups in, in the quantum theory. And um, so, uh, yeah, and now we have to distinguish these two situations um, um, that I discussed before um, that are internally indistinguishable, but that are distinguishable relative to R. So for instance, um, that we have a global translation that involves R, well, then, you know, the relations between R and S are invariant. It's the same physical situation. Such a transformation we will call a gauge transformation. And uh, we also have the situation, um, uh, you know, we can have also the situation that A, B, and C are moved or translated relative to R, like this. Um, this is now a change of physical situation because the relation between R and the system S has changed. And this is what we will shall be calling a symmetry. And we'll see the analog in the gauge theory later. And um, importantly, um, these gauge transformations, these global translations, um, which translates uh, all degrees of freedom um, by, in the same way. Um, they're generated by a constraint, which is just the total momentum, including the momentum of R. Um, and uh, well, the symmetries, um, the relative displacement of S and R um, uh, which is generated by a charge, um, uh, which is basically the, um, the, the momentum only of, of, uh, of the external reference frame R. Um, so now, um, uh, the, the important thing here is that we can uh, interpret these, these symmetries, um, in fact, as frame reorientations, because, um, well, what's happening is we're just changing um, the relative position of, um, of the system S and R, and, and by, by this charge acting on, on, on QR, on the position of R, you know, we're just changing the position of it, and the position is like the orientation of the frame. And indeed, if you look at um, these relational observables that I had before um, that are a function of this parameter x, if you um, differentiate with respect to x, that's equal to taking this, um, this charge q and taking the Poisson bracket with that relational observable. And so that's a new perspective on these symmetries um, that you can actually interpret them as frame reorientations. So you change the orientation here, in this case, the position of the, of the, um, of the reference frame. Now, um, how would you do reference frame changes here uh, as far as relational observables are concerned? Um, you, we could add now in a second edge mode, so a second um, uh, external reference frame R2, which is dynamical, so which we can consider as being an internalized external frame. So it's external to the system S. And of course, um, well, first of all, we can describe both the system S and R2 relative um, to reference frame R1. Um, but we can also do, of course, the same uh, uh, relative to R2. Um, and if you do a counting of, of degrees of freedom, I mean, it's, it's just not, you know, the, um, since we have one uh, global constraint as global translation uh, invariance, um, uh, if you look at the degrees of freedom here, these relative distances and then corresponding momenta, um, this actually, so, so these are, in fact, four relative distances and, and four, um, um, and momenta, these account really for, um, so we have four canonical pairs, sorry. Um, and indeed, if you do a degree of freedom counting, we have a 10-dimensional um, uh, kinematical phase space, one constraint. Um, and so that means we are left with eight uh, gauge invariant independent degrees of freedom in the end. So um, you know, what we're doing here is just uh, uh, two different coordinatizations or parameterizations of the gauge invariant physics 
one's relative to R1, one's relative to R2. And so in that sense, the reference frame changes, they really just amount to a change of coordinates on, on, on the uh, gauge invariant phase space, which is taking the constraint surface and modding out the gauge flows. And, um, and, and, ter and indeed, it's actually a canonical transformation on it. Um, so, um, so they're not arbitrary coordinate changes, but changes of relational observable families that are associated with frames. Now, um, let me discuss now the analog of this in, in gauge theory. So we're now going to um, finite region gauge theories. And now suppose we're given, um, so this here is now going to be a spatial subregion M with boundary um, delta M. This is now going to be our subsystem S that we were discussing before, for instance, as well. And now suppose we're given some compact gauge group G um, with a connection A. So basically what I'm talking about here could be Young Mills theory, it could be um, Maxwell's theory, it could be Chern Simon's theory, it, it doesn't matter. So, um, and now what are gauge invariant degrees of freedom within a given uh, the sub region? Well, they could be some Wilson loops um, or, for instance, the trace of, uh, of the field strengths or some other uh, gauge invariant objects. And now, um, yeah, or, um, yeah, and now the main point is that the physics is now internally indistinguishable under gauge transformation, so which acts, uh, for instance, on the um, on the connection in this particular way here, um, taking into account non Um And now what we want to do is we want to describe um, that region M um, relative to an external frame. So in some sense, we can view um, a complementary region M prime as in some sense the external observer of M. And that's uh, similar to this uh, extension of the Heisenberg cut that I was discussing before. Um, and uh, what we can do now is um, we can take um, some um, Wilson line. Um, uh, for instance, suppose uh, this, this region M prime is really the full complement of the region M, so which goes all the way to asymptotia, where gauge transformations vanish asymptotically. And we can take, um, for instance, some Wilson line um, that we shoot in from some points, uh, some asymptotic points to the boundary of the region M. Um, this is, of course, a group valued uh, object uh, being the Wilson line. Um, and it's an ex we can view that as an external reference frame to the subregion M, which is defined on the, um, on the boundary delta M which is dynamically independent from the other degrees of freedom in M because it depends non-trivially on the dynamics in M prime. So, you know, we can wiggle around in M prime and thereby change actually this, uh, this, this uh, Wilson line. And, and, you know, for that reason, this, this degree of freedom that we call UX here on the point X on the boundary is going to be dynamically independent of the other degrees of freedom of M. So in that sense, it's an external degree of freedom for the, for the other degrees of freedom in M. And um, it is a group valued reference frame. So it's, it clearly transforms um, by left multiplication under gauge transformation, particularly under small gauge transformation. So, um, you know, the gauge transformation vanished asymptotically. So this object is just going to be uh, transforming yeah, by, by left multiplication under G. And um, in that sense, it, it provides us, so it transforms non trivially. And in that sense, it actually provides us a nice uh, parameterization of the orbits, the gauge orbits of the group G uh, locally at that point X. In that sense, um, and it's in particular also faithful, in fact, it's a complete reference frame for the gauge group G at the point X uh, because it transforms here uh, faithfully under that, that group. And it's an external reference frame. And that's, in fact, what we can call an edge mode. Um, uh, at the point X uh, of, on, on, the, on the boundary of that region M. And now um, here, I've so far only talked about a single point X, but of course, uh, since there's a field theory, you would have to do this for any point X on the boundary. Um, so we would have to have a whole system of paths to um, shoot in from asymptotia to, um, to this boundary delta M. And in that sense, you could really generate an entire edge mode field on, on this boundary. But here in the sequel, of, um, for simplicity, I'm just going to focus on a particular point X, but what I'm going to talk about holds for any such point X. And uh, now, just as before, we can actually build these uh, relational observables. So use the reference frame um, to describe other degrees of freedom within uh, the region M relative to, to U, to this external reference frame. And um, 
it turns out this is defined in this particular way. So we have, um, let's say, phi is some functional of um, the connection A and the field strength, let's say, on the boundary. Then um, uh, it turns out a gauge invariant observable, a relational observable, is uh, defined in this particular way, um, where you take the, um, it's, a, it's a reference frame, which is a reference frame dressed uh, observable. So U, the reference frame appears. It's a, it's a group valued object, but it's a dynamical group valued object. And G prime is like the reference frame orientation label. For instance, like this X that I had before um, here, uh, you know, in, in, in these particular examples. So this, um, this G uh, here is, is a group valued, um, um, group valued uh, parameter uh, field. Uh, so it's just a, uh, it's not dynamical. And this, can, it turns out you can actually interpret this then really as the value of what's, you know, what's the value of, of this uh, functional phi when, when uh, this reference frame U is in this orientation G prime. And uh, this allows us again to turn all the boundary degrees of freedom of, of, of M into gauge invariant degrees of freedom through the relation with the edge mode. For example, you can now turn the connection on the boundary into a radiative connection, uh, which then turns uh, out to have this form, which is just applying that formula to it. And you can convince yourself that this is actually gauge invariant. And now um, we can consider again, um, you know, gauge transformations. So that's what we discussed before. So gauge transformations, the reference frame transforms by left multiplication. Um, um, but we can now distinguish this also from uh, symmetries again, or frame reorientations. So frame reorientations are now reorientations of the asymptotic frame. So at asymptotia, we can consider this as a change of trivialization. Um, uh, and this, um, well, this amounts then to a right multiplication of the, of the reference frame by some group element G. Um, so uh, symmetries as frame reorientations, they act on the other side of the reference frame than gauge transformations. And this is something that has been discussed before. Um, I, what, what I should say is that if you, I forgot to say, so if you, if you do this uh, frame reorientation, it, it will really in this relational observable, it will change the, it will translate um, this, this label uh, G prime accordingly. And um, this connects with what has been done before in the literature on, on edge modes, in particular by uh, Will Donnelly and Laurent Friedel in 2016, um, where they are introduced this distinction between gauge transformations and symmetries at, uh, and gauge theories for edge modes, um, but they didn't uh, make the connection with reference frames and uh, in particular frame reorientations. So with the work uh, that I've uh, summarized before, we can now draw connections to frame reorientations. And also here you will find that, um, you know, these gauge transformations are generated by, by constraints while these symmetries are generated by charges in analogy to what I um, discussed in this, uh, in this simple practical model before. Okay, um, and now, uh, uh, we can now in fact also consider reference frame transformations in field theory. Um, and in that sense, if we do it locally, we can have in fact many different edge modes at one and the same point X. These will correspond to different systems of paths. Um, so different ways of shooting holonomies in from the asymptotic boundary to the point X. These will be dynamic in general dynamically independent degrees of freedom. Um, and so will correspond to different um, external or internalized external reference frames for the subregion M. And then just an analogy to uh, what I discussed before, you can then also do um, uh, uh, reference frame transformations going from the relational observables relative to, uh, let's say reference frame one to, uh, to reference frame two. And uh, um, well, these are coordinate changes on the extended phase space to make it more precise, you have to go into the covariant phase space language uh, that we do. And um, uh, yeah, and in fact, there are nothing but uh, field redefinitions on the covariant phase space. But they're not um, arbitrary field redefinitions. They're really uh, changes of relational observable families uh, associated with different frames that have a particular physical meaning. And uh, uh, they have many different implications um, that, uh, that we'll discuss in, a, in an upcoming paper with uh, Sylvain Carosa. Um, yeah, I think maybe uh, time has progressed a little too quickly. So there's a couple of other topics I could have discussed, um, uh, but maybe let me uh, leave it at this point since we're already one hour 15. Um, 
So the paradox of the third particle is basically uh, something one of foundations. Um, yeah, it, it's a practical paradox that's related to um, boundaries and gauge theories, um, but it probably will take a little too long to discuss. And uh, let me maybe also leave the dessert, which was discussing what role reference frames play for interpreting invariant observables. Um, and uh, let me maybe just conclude, um, unless you have any questions, of course. So um, yeah, let me maybe conclude the talk. Um, so I've given you some overview over uh, yeah, the perspective neutral approach to dynamical reference frame covariance. Uh, the first part in, in, in mechanical or uh, quantum cosmological systems, particularly in the quantum theory. Um, and then a later part also in the in, in gauge theories. It also applies in fact to, to gravity. Um, I didn't say very much about that. Um, now, um, yeah, what is this perspective neutral approach? It's a gauge invariant framework for frame dependent physics, both classically and in the quantum theory. Um, it gives a way of linking all the internal frame perspectives um, in a given gauge system. Uh, it applies, like I said, both to classical and quantum theory, it can apply to practical systems, relational clock models, quantum cosmology, gauge theories, gravity. Um, it yields also a relativity of, of subsystems and many physical properties that I discussed, such as, for instance, the quantum relativity of correlations, superpositions, entropies, and so on. And uh, it also provides us a way of, of trying to understand edge modes that have been discussed a lot in recent years in the literature, really as, uh, as, edge, uh, as, as um, reference frames in the same sense in, in, in which they have been discussed in other areas of physics but with the particular interpretation of being sort of internalized external reference frames to a subregion of, of your space time. And um, yeah, I will leave it at this and uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah, thanks Philip for your talk. Uh, it's very rapid elaborative talk. If anybody have any questions, uh, please ask. Just before that, please give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk. So please, if you have any question, please ask. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, uh, like on the slide, like a uh, 37 number slide, uh, could you go there? Uh, like I have a few. 37? Mm -hmm. You can um, just click. Yeah, uh, 37 of the PDF. Yeah. This oh, one? A, a slide before that. This one? Uh, yeah, so like in this, like you are arguing that the swapping thing, like you're saying, like entanglement depends on perspective, like the C which you are arguing out that. Uh, when you see from the C's perfect uh, perspective, you're saying, uh, like, uh, can you explain like these diagrams, like once? Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry, I was maybe a little quick. So, here, what they discussed in this paper a couple of years back. Um, was different uh, examples of this. Um, of this reference frame transformation that we have now really arrived in this perspective neutral approach. And that's, so they arrived at this reference frame transformation here, they proposed it in a different way. So in some sense, what we did here was a justification of this. But anyway, they just took this operator here and then they um, took some uh, example states uh, from what they call A perspective and then mapped it to B, well, in that case, it's C perspective, it's C and A, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, I mean, there's different examples here that they discuss, but one is pictorially that, um, for instance, in C's perspective, um, so in the Hilbert space of AB relative to C, um, the state here is that um, you have an entangled state between A and B, where, um, uh, yeah, it's a superposition of, of um, yeah, A and B, um, you know, in, in either case being uh, separated by a fixed distance L. And you know either a being um, yeah at, at maybe a point x uh, or some point y, and um, and then they just threw that uh, quantum reference frame transformation so this object on it to see what that gives in in a's perspective, and what you find in a's perspective that it gives a sorry what I forgot to say actually probably was that it gives you a product state between um, uh, b and c where B is now in a, in a peak position. So these are delta distributions here. Yeah? So where B is in a, um, so they're position eigenstates, sorry. So where B is in a fixed position, 
And uh, the fixed position is in fact uh, L relative to the origin. Um, so it's the same L here. And C is uh, now relative to A in a um, superposition of, of peak positions. So you can generalize that to, to wave packets, which is done in, in, in B here. But, um, but let's uh, take these delta distributions for the moment. And so here you have a, um, uh, you know, a, um, a, an entangled state between A and B. And um, uh, you know, both uh, A and B are in some sense delocalized relative to C, so in, in superposition. So B is in particular um, um, you know, a superposition relative to C, but when you are now in A's perspective, uh, B is not in superposition. Uh, but C is now in superposition. And now here there's a, uh, there's a product state between B and C, and here's an entangled state between A and B. Now this is only for, for three particles here, of course, but you could generalize it to four, five, six particles, and then look at also, uh, for instance, um, you know, let's say there's an additional particle D, um, and then you uh, look at the entanglement between B and D, so B and D are uh, the two degrees of freedom that are not uh, the initial or the final reference frame. And you'll find that in general, that entanglement will also um, uh, depend on, on whether you're in C's or A's perspective. Okay, so so like, in that sense, you get yeah. uh, you know, a, a, a frame, a quantum frame dependence on, uh, of correlations and, and also superpositions. Yeah, that, that operator, what does it physically mean like that operator? Like, could we calculate that operator in the previous, in the previous slide, the swapping operator? This one? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Is it like physically, can we like uh, give a value to it? Like, can you measure like this? Uh, like, uh, suppose, uh, I mean, um, this perspective and uh, others perspective, like, could we? Uh, yeah, so it, it's a little hard to, I mean, so to give a value to it is, um, so um, yeah, so operationally, I wouldn't really know off the top of my head, my head what it would mean to measure that that operator. Mm -hmm. So um, so you know, if, if you were to ask me how would I do this in a laboratory, um, that's uh, kind of tricky. Um, but in principle, um, there is ways of determining it um, for sure. Um, now, it, the thing is, of course, being an operator, um, well, what kind of values you could assign to it depends on states. Um, uh, yeah, that depends on what sort of inputs that you have. Um, but in general, for instance, you could also have a situation okay. that you have a state be that's that, uh, very classical yeah. or something like this. Because actually, it turns out, so one thing that I didn't really discuss very much here is that um, these quantum reference frame transformations, they are um, relation conditional uh, transformations. So they're relation conditional um, translations in this particular example. So it means um, what actually happens is how far you translate your systems depends on the relation between the frame and, uh, well, in fact, it depends on the, on the, uh, on the gauge invariant relation between the old and the new frame. Um, that's by how much you have to translate. And, um, uh, in the quantum theory, you know that relation will, of course, not in general be in a peaked state. But if you if you were to pick a situation where um, where the physical state, the perspective neutral state, is such that uh, that the relation between A and B is in a delta function, so um, you know it's in a, in a peaked state, then um, this would become, in fact, the classical translation really. But uh, in general, of course, um, there's no reason for this relation to be peaked. So it can be in some horrible superposition. And because of that, it will become a very non-trivial operator. And so in that sense, I mean, you can view these, these quantum reference frame transformations really as some, um, yeah, as, as some fuzzy classical uh, translations, if you want, in this specific example. In the more general case, well, they're kind of fuzzy you know, group transformations. They're always relation conditional group transformations. They always depend on the gauge invariant relation between the old and the new frame. And so if that relation is peaked, the transformation will behave very classically. If it's not peaked, uh, the, the physical state on the relation, then, then it will be some very non-trivial um, transformation. But the important thing is that at least in this simple example here, um, it turns out that the Transformation is in fact a unitary, so it's a um, so you can map the entire information from A's perspective to B's perspective. So 
Um, there is a situation when there's no longer holes, um, when you have more complicated uh, systems. Um, there's this example here that we just, no, this one here, there will be an update soon. Um, it's related to this Riboff problem in the end. So because the frame perspectives, they're related to a way of gauge fixing, and sometimes this gauge fixing can't be done globally. Um, if you can't do it globally, then these quantum coordinate maps, just like coordinate maps on a manifold, they will not be globally valid. And that means you can't actually, um, you know, map an arbitrary set of states into a particular perspective, but only subset, just like you have it with coordinate maps on a manifold. So you get similar effects also here uh, with dynamical reference frames. Um, yeah, so, and, but basically, you know, more generally, so since you were asking about this, how should I think of this more generally? So more generally, this is what I tried to explain here in this, um, um, uh, you know, in this quantum relativity of subsystems. So this applies to that example in particular, but it's more general. The point is that the, the notion of gauge invariant subsystem um, is, is frame dependent. So for instance, what, uh, a, uh, what B and C mean by A, um, those are different gauge invariant observables. And that's just because what we mean kinematically by the subsystem A, so which is defined on the kinematic Hilbert space, say, if you want to turn that into gauge invariant observables, well, you can do it in, in, these, in this way of these relational observables, but a relational observable always depends on, on a choice of reference frame. And so there's just different relational ways of, of referring to subsystem A, and these correspond then to the relational observables of A, for instance, relative to B, or A relative to C. Um, so, so far, so good, but then what you can actually show that not only um, you know, the individual relational observables are distinct, but the entire algebras of these relational observables, they're distinct algebras. So, you know, you could have thought maybe, oh, okay, maybe, you know, what I mean by this particular observable of kinematical, of, kinematical observable of A relative to B and C, um, those might be two different gauge invariant observables, but maybe um, if I look at all the relational observables of A relative to B, it's the same set as, as all the relational observables of A relative to C, but it turns out it's, it's not uh, the case. So they're different, they're different sets of observables, really. They're, they're overlapping, but, um, but not completely. And uh, it turns out that, yeah, if, if you have a tensor factorization, and in that simple example um, with those translation invariants, you have tensor factorizations, but these tensor factorizations of the algebra and also of the physical Hilbert space they will be physically distinct. So they're gauge invariant tensor factorizations because they correspond to tensor factorizations induced by gauge invariant observables, but they're different tensor factorizations, which is uh, why um, we have a, um, you know, uh, the gauge invariant notion of subsystem um, is actually dependent on your choice of frame. And because the notion of subsystem depends on your choice of frame, also what you mean by correlations and superpositions and so on, will uh, you know, depend on your choice of frame. So that's just a straightforward consequence after that. And also like, instead of like in the 1D chain, which you showed like, uh, instead of talking about A's reference and B's reference, just take, the, take, them, to, take them to be indistinguishable particles, okay? And just change the position. Will it like change the problem? We just um, like- Yeah, so that would change the problem. So, um, so, so far here in everything we've done, we've considered, um, you know, ABC as distinguishable systems. So if you were to now add, um, uh, you know, uh, um, indistinguishability to a problem, then, then sure, then you have to add an additional constraint to it, which is symmetry or anti-symmetry of, you know, whatever statistics you're looking at. Um, so we haven't discussed that yet, um, but that would definitely change um, uh, you know, in details, um, the picture, but the the qualitative feature that um, that you'll get a frame dependence of what you mean by subsystems and so on, um, that won't change. So it's just um, the detailed way of phrasing it that will that will look different. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions or comments? Nilesh, you have anything? Uh, no, sir, not right now. Sada, Fatma? Uh, no, sir, no. Or 
it's Gary Shaktoshi. Uh, no, sir, not right now. I'll uh, like oh. maybe mail him later. Then uh, thank him again for giving such a nice talk. Uh, so stay safe and healthy. And right now you are uh, in Europe, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in one month I'm going back to Japan. Yeah. So yeah, likewise, uh, stay well. Yeah. And well, yeah. hopefully in your case, get better. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you soon. And yeah. Thanks for your attention. Okay.